Good to bring. Thank you, Brother Dale. And I want to say a good morning to each and every one of you here. And it's certainly a, a grand privilege of being here in this Chattanooga area again to <coughs> place my uh, part of my ministry in the help of you brethren to continue the work that's already been established, our Lord Jesus, to build upon this principle. And we're enjoying this meeting. Long has it lived in my heart, the last meeting <coughs> that we were here together. And much water's went out the river since then. Many things has been done. Many battles have been fought and won for our Lord. And this morning it's a, such a wonderful thing to be here at the table of you men and women, you fellow citizens of the kingdom of God, brothers and sisters of like precious faith. Uh, you're aware that I'm not a speaker. I just love to say what I can for his glory, knowing if I have a voice, I want to use what I have got for his glory. And I wished I was a speaker as Brother Vale and many of you people, but God never called me for that. I was called for a, another type of ministry. And we are, I wouldn't try to take Brother Vale's place or your place. It'd be just as hard for me to take his place probably as for him to take my place. So. We just abide in our calling and do what we can for the great kingdom of God. I'm glad to be back down in the good old south again. You know, there's something about the southern states that I like. I was born on this soil down here, you know, so there's something about it like coming back home. And I get way up in the north, they say, hey, say, fellow, you must be from the south. <laughs> I thought I spoke English. <laughs> Until I went to England. <laughs> I need an interpreter in England worse than anywhere I ever was at. <laughs> Every time I'd speak, to say, what part of Texas are you from? <laughs> I just couldn't make out. But when they talk way down here, you know, that real far. I went to the corner one time in London. I was going down to find the Westminster Abbey. I'm not a mimic by a long ways. I'm going to try to impersonate something. There's a gentleman standing on the corner with the cane over his arm, a regular English cockney, and I said, How do you do, sir? He, looking over his glasses, spoke to me. I said, Could you tell me how to get to the Westminster Abbey? Frowned a little bit, looked at me. He said, Certainly, old chubby. He said, you go three blokes this way, you turn three blokes that way, go straight ahead says you can't miss it. <laughs> Brother David Duplessis is about the only one who would understand that here, I guess, this morning. <laughs> oh, I knew I wasn't, a, wasn't very much uh, on the English. But I enjoyed being with man everywhere because they're creatures of God. Amen. And now, to try to, as usually on a Christian businessman's breakfast, I usually kind of preach a little bit to those fellows. And I, but now before ministers, I wouldn't try that. But I just want to read some scripture because every gathering we are supposed to read the scriptures and so forth. I think it, uh, and back in the early days, when they used to meet, they broke bread, took the communion, every time they met. And uh, I like that, too. Of course, we're out of that practice. But I like to read just a portion of his word, where it's, that if we don't get nothing else but this, this will be fine. It's found a last commission of our Lord. And a man's last will should be the, uh, the one that's sufficient. And here's what he said to his church, the last words as he left the world, found in Mark, the 16th chapter, 14th verse, beginning. After he appeared unto the leaven as they sat at meat, and abraded them of their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him, 
after it is risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. If they take up serpents or if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So after, after the Lord had had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and set on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. Amen. This is known as the, the Great Commission. It was the last word that our Lord spoke. And the first time he sent out his disciples in Matthew 10, we find that he gave them a commission to go heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. It's freely as you have received, freely give. And the last commission he gave, go into all the world, discontinue as they did at the first. Heal the sick and lay hands on the sick and cast out devils. And it's a privilege for me, brethren, to stand with man like you, shoulder to shoulder in this great fight that the world call Christianity, and take my position by your side as a one who believes that that commission is still just as essential as it was the hour it was given. And in this great field that we're in, we find many times that we come with the order of different denominational you know, phases of, of the Scripture. Some of them... Christ's commission here was to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Now, the gospel doesn't only consist of the word only, but through the power and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, because the only way that it could be done for these signs to follow would be the word to take life. So it would have to be the Holy Spirit that would give life in the Word to produce these signs. You brethren believe that. Then after leaving the Baptist church and coming over with my Pentecostal brethren because I seen that they had something. They believe this. And but I found different denominations. First first group I found was what Many determines, as many of you brethren perhaps of the same denomination here this morning, oneness. Well, that's what I thought they called them Pentecost for. <coughs> well then, I met some fine men. It wasn't long after that till I found there was another group. And they were called the Trinitarians. <coughs> then I found another group called the Jesus Only. Then they found the different factions like the Assemblies of God and the Church of God and the Church and Prophecy, all of these. Now here's where I want to explain to you, brethren, see. I would not dare in any means to try to start something new. I believe it's you, brethren, and your father. Back in the early days when they went forth with this blessing 40 years ago when I was a baby in my mother's arms. You never went forth under some little emotional mental workup. You went forth with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And you founded something. You've laid down a foundation. God forbid that I be one man to try to build on any other foundation. If God laid that foundation, we build on that foundation because I believe it's founded in the Word of God. Therefore, that's the reason today that I don't belong to the different groups uh, or take sides with either one. I'm not here to take sides with groups. I'm here for on a principle I'm standing for. 
And that principle is the kingdom of God. The church of God building on the principle of it here. Here's the assemblies of God over here and the oneness in here and different ones, how the groups are arranged around the interdenominationals. But it's all should be, and I believe it is, built principally upon Christ. So that's the reason I don't take sides with the groups, is to say, I will be a church of God. That would be fine. I just as soon belong to the church of God as the assemblies, and I soon belong to the assemblies as it would the oneness, or whatever it is. It doesn't matter to me. But there's one great storehouse, one great principle. That's Christ. And that's why I stood with you, brethren, in this manner. That I could shoulder side by side with you. And help you bear the burden. And stand the reproach with you. With the joy in my heart. To know that I've tucked sides with what I think is right. Based upon the scripture. And when I come to the city, that's the reason I like to come on the interdenominational scale. That everybody's welcome. Every person and every everyone. We uh, that's the way we like it. And if a man's got to work, if he's if he's a denomination or independent, as long as he's building on Christ, uh, I'm shoulder to shoulder with him. If he's a Methodist or a Baptist uh, or a Presbyterian or a Lutheran, whatever it is, I want to shoulder with him anyhow. And may I drop this little thing to you, brethren. As I know your different denominations. I think I've never talked like this to a group of people. But in this locality here, you and, and throughout the, the nation it's becoming now. If the devil can keep us separated, Amen. He, he's got to shoot at one another, so he, he's got an open target anywhere he wants to shoot. Amen. And what's the use of shooting? We're shooting one another. That's right. See? See? So he can just step back and relax. But did you ever, let me just give you, if I have found grace in your sight through God, you take my word for this, brother. If you want to be a blessing and get a blessing when a man has done you wrong, and he's absolutely justly, he, I mean, he has done you wrong and you know that he's done you wrong. He's done you evil. Don't mention that. You take him to prayer before God. And don't take it in a way of just a selfish and say, well, I'm supposed to do this. But stand with your shoulder to his shoulder. And stand in the presence of God our Father. The way a prayer should be made. In the presence of God. Say, Father, here's my brother. And he's, he is... Justly, he deserves punishment because he has he's done me evil. And I don't see why he did it. Then let God go to talking to you. And you'll see maybe what that man's been through. The devil has twisted him up somewhere and caused him to do that, though he's absolutely wrong. Before you leave the throne of God, you'll be feeling sorry for that man. You'll be sympathizing with that brother. And when you get back down to where earth again, you'll go over to that brother and shake his hand. Because you know what he's been through. You can't stand with a mortal in the presence of God and condemn anybody, I don't believe. Amen. No, sir. Even if he's a rank sinner. And why about a brother that's made a mistake? No, I say he's wrong. Sometimes he's accused wrong when he's not wrong. But if he is wrong, if we'll take him to the throne of God, stand there shoulder to shoulder with our brother, know that he's a mortal, and maybe his destination rests upon our attitude towards him. When we come back from the throne of God, we'll realize that we're ever one guilty. Amen. And we all need help one from the other. And the best way to do is pray. Now, these great principles, the great church of the living God, if it, would, if it wouldn't have to say, now we'll all belong to this organization or that one, if they would unite in heart, one accord, there'd be a revival strike this world like it's never seen. If the people who has the Pentecostal experience 
would just unite in heart together, let their denominations run any way they want to. What difference is these little frictions and so forth? It's just the devil trying to keep the great church in a turmoil all the time. Amen. After all, in Acts 10.35, it's written that God's no respect of person or nation, but he, he has honor for those who serve God and do righteous. See, we, we know that's true. God respects the person that's got... In the ministry, I think this morning, that it would be good for me to say this, to show you what an effect it has. The American people, you, brethren, are in the hardest field there is anywhere. I've been in Africa, India, through uh, practically the world over. But I, I have never seen a field so hard to battle as here, America. This needs missionaries worse than anywhere I've ever seen in all my life. For an educated heathen is harder to deal with than an uneducated heathen. Heathen is an unbeliever. And you have that. And you've got the battle here. The missionary may have a lot of stuff to contend with, malaria and meba and so forth like that, but he don't have the demon spirits to deal with. I mean those demons that's got into culture-minded man. That's right. Oh, you talk about something hard to deal with. Recently I had a breakfast with a bunch of ministers. And I say this with respect, brethren. I would have rather had a breakfast with a bunch of witch doctors. Now that sounds horrible to say than these men. I would have had a better reception I'd have had a more an agreeing spirit with a bunch of witch doctors many times than I would with that bunch of ministers. Such a horrible thing. God delivers from such. Amen. We are so intellectual. Everything is moved away from the spirit. It's the word. It's word. It's word. God, I sure I believe in the word. But if the spirit don't agree with the word, then you've got something mixed up somewhere. Amen. Look at when... Cain, he was just as religious and just as much with the word as Abel was. It was the revelation that made the difference. They both worshipped. They both brought sacrifices. They both built altars. They both belonged to church. They both were sincere. They both worshipped. So if God only respects sincerity and fundamentalism, why didn't he respect Cain? But through revelation, Abel, being just, by revelation, no scriptures in them days. God had revealed it to him that it wasn't fruit, apples and oranges taking us out of the Garden of Eden. It was blood, the life. On their journey, the children of Israel, they come up against the children of Moab. Moab, the land of Moab, was not infidelic. They believed in the same God that Israel believed in. And they were all organized together, tightly, great nations. Israel dwelt in tents that had no nation. I don't say this to be rude now. I say it for a point. Israel was more like an interdenominational. It had no land of its own as yet. And it was moving up. They asked permission to pass through their brother's land. And what did they get? Turned down. And they had... Balaam come out and build his altars, seven altars. He, you notice he put seven clean sacrifices on it, books. And he also put seven rams, speaking of Christ's coming. And down in the camp of Israel was just the same sacrifices. So fundamentally, Moab was just as fundamental as Israel was. But the thing that they failed to see is what the world's failing to see today. And their prophet up there failed to see it. Balaam thought surely that a holy God would condemn a people like that, but he failed to see that smitten rock, that brass serpent, and the pillar of fire, the signs and wonders. God has always dwelt with people, or God was signs and wonders taking place. It's always been. That's the way they look at the Pentecostal church today. 
Oh, they're all bunched up. They're this, that, and the other. Well, who isn't? Tell me one church that is. Look at our Baptist church. Look at the denominations and offsprings of free Baptist, a hard shell Baptist, primitive Baptist. Thirty some odd different sections of them. Just as bad as Pentecostal. And they fuss and fight with one another the same way. Look at the Methodist church. Even the Catholic church. Any of them. But what they fail to see is they climb onto you, brethren, a lot of time because of newspapers. You make a mistake. Let one of our brethren make a mistake and do something immorally. Watch the newspapers across the country. will spread it just as hard as they can. That's the devil. But let one of these other ministers do it. It hushed down. But on the books of heaven, it's just the same. Amen. That's right. Amen. But the reason I take my shoulders with you, brethren, there's a shout of the king in the king. There's signs and wonders following these people. They make their mistakes and they get a lot of isms and a lot of nonsense. You know that, brethren. You, we might as well face it. That's right. We've got a lot of things that goes on of impersonations and so forth that isn't right. But there's a real thing there, too. That's right. Hallelujah. When Jesus came, he was just as fundamental as the Pharisees. The Pharisees couldn't believe it. But Jesus was fundamental. But there were signs and wonders following his ministry. Well, the Pharisees had the word just the same as he had, the same word. But it's a spiritual revelation. Jesus witnessed to it when he came off the mountain. And he said, Who does man say I, the Son of Man, am? One said Elisha, and one said it was a prophet, and so forth. He said, But who do you say? And Peter said, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. Now the Catholic Church says that Peter was the rock. And upon this rock the church was built. The Protestant Church says it was upon Jesus the rock. Not to be different. Let them believe what they wish to, as long as it's on Christ. But I, I different from both views. I believe that it was not upon Peter that the church was built, neither was it upon Christ the church was built, but it was upon the spiritual revelation that he was the Christ. See? See? Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Some seminary, some school, some theology, some intellectual. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven, upon this rock I'll build my church. The spiritual revelation, not by word, not by denomination, not by creed, not by so forth, but upon spiritual revelation that Jesus is the Christ. I'll build my church. Now, you might believe that in your mind. When you believe that in the heart, you've got eternal life. Jesus said in St. John 5, 24, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me has eternal life. Take that word eternal and see what it means. Run it back in the Greek, you'll find it's Zoe, God's own life. You've got immortal life in you because what? You have believed on him being the only begotten Son of God and accepted him as your personal Savior. Not by intellectual, but by a birth, how God has brought it down and revealed it to you by spiritual revelation. Faith cometh by hearing. Faith is hearing when you hear it. But faith isn't the thing. For instance, I'm here, I'm starving to death, and I asked you for a, for a loaf of bread, and you give me 25 cents. That's the purchase power of a loaf of bread. Now, I can rejoice just as much with the 25 cents as I could with the loaf of bread. But yet, it's not the loaf of bread. It's not the loaf of bread. But I can be happy with it. I'll keep the 25 cents knowing, thank you, sir. My life shall now be saved, but I haven't got the bread. You get what I mean? See, by faith you are saved, but it's a revelation of Christ that brings the results. You get what I mean? See, that's what I'm speaking of. That's what the world's hungering for. And the reason that the rest of the world isn't coming into the Pentecostal belief as we have it is because it's our own attitude towards one another. That's truth, brethren. It's because of our indifference to each other. They see one talking against the other, and one against the other, and this against that, and this denomination. They're scared of it. 
I don't know what the solution is. I've tried it. One wants to, if this group will sponsor, well, the rest of them have nothing to do with it. You can imagine what a, what a position it puts me in. And I say, well, if I let this one, the other one, then they won't come together. So I thought, well, I'll just go without any of them. I'll go anyhow. That's wrong. I found that to be wrong. Because in, in India, I had the same thing, or I guess twice the conversions that happened in Africa, at one altar call. But there was no one there to sponsor it, so where did they go? Back to the temples of Buddha and so forth. You've got to recognize these organizations and these places where they got the missions and so forth to bring your convert to and these churches throughout the country. So you see what a predicament it puts me in when I try to stand independent? Or Roberts told me that one time. He belongs to the Pentecostal Church of God, I believe, or Pentecostal Holiness Church of God, something, one of those. Anyhow, see, he's represented with the church where I stand free from the church and yet with the church. I'm with the church. Amen. The real, the body of Christ to every denomination. Amen. Trying to pull us together. I wanted to explain that to you so that you brethren would understand. And now, if you go into a place and have a group of converts, just go and set a meeting up and say, here I am. The people will come. That's right. Where the carcasses, the eagles will be gathered. But what if the they become converts, then who's going to take them? Who's there to catch it? Who's there to conserve that a reserve that what you have already caught by the gospel. And who's going to pick up the fish? If they're laying on the bank, they'll perish. Somebody's got to be there to do that. So you just, I can't work without you, brethren. Oh, if they could all be one in heart. And uh, for the same principle, and just tear down the little differences. Right here in the city today, Billy Graham can come to this city and he'll start off down here at this little tabernacle full of 15, 20,000 perhaps or around within the amount of time that I've been here. Why? Because they get themselves together. They're in one accord. If they can do that by the letter, how much more should we do it by the Spirit? See? If a, if a brother, if old Roberts, if some of the other brethren would come to the city, let's go behind it. It's our duties to stand by our brethren. See? It's right. And then what does that do? It shows to the public. Amen. If we don't, then what does it do to the public? You see, look at them. Here, they got this guy in here. See? see what I mean? That's what takes place. Now, the effects of a revival can long be felt. If, and it'll, it'll benefit the whole church of God. If, if we had hundred converts tonight and one went to each one of you brothers' churches, see, whatever it was, that's not just affecting only your church, your church and your church, but it's affecting the kingdom of God through each one of these places. There's where I'm trying to build for is here. Down here, it doesn't matter to me what if they want to be baptized this way or that way. What difference does that make anyhow? God give you the Holy Ghost with your peculiarities. He give me the Holy Ghost with my peculiarities. And God gives those the Holy Ghost who obeyed Him, not who obeyed Him. See? There you are, see? We just draw these little straws and things, and that's just what the devil wants. But I believe, my brethren, that there's coming an hour that when a real rank persecution will run us together, then we will be one. The church shall come together. I believe it's all in the making of God after painting this picture to you. When, when Solomon's temple was built, it was cut out all over the world. And one block was solved this way and one that way. But when they come together, every stone went to its place without a sound of a hammer or the buzz of a saw. And it was the church of the living God. And I believe that through the Church of God, the prophecy, and the other great church, the Lee College, or whichever it is here, and through you assembly brethren, through you independent brethren, and through you oneness brethren, and through all of you, and God's cutting out stones. And someday, that master stone, 
that rejected stone, when the church got so far up, they found out they had a freak stone. They couldn't find no place it fit. But they come to find out that was the chief cornerstone. And I think, brethren, that one of these days, we're going to realize that chief cornerstone is the love of God, Christ, in our hearts that will bind every one of us together as one. Amen. Then the great church will be kept over and God will take it to glory. And the services. I might give you just a little view of some things that are happening so that you can see where our Lord God, the great shepherd of the flock, how he does move in miraculous ways. I said this this morning so that you, brethren, could understand. If someone says, Brother Branham, a simile? Is he a oneness? Yeah, I'm a simile. I'm a oneness. I'm a church of God. I'm a pilgrim holiness. I'm a Nazarene. <laughs> I, I, I belong to Christ which all of you belong to you see. and uh, so uh, I do belong to each one of your uh, uh, of you brethren we are, we are brothers together see. and now that's the way we want to live that's the way we want to act That's in your family your own children there's hardly two of them that will agree with one another but they're the same family Amen. sure they are they might differ in features they might differ in appetites they might differ in every way but yet they're one family and we're the family of Christ I'm not trying to say Jimmy I'm with you John I'm against you I'm saying Jimmy and John we're both in the same family you see what I mean we're all working together on this farm to make a living for the family now that's the way I stand if anybody happened to ask you anytime you just let that be known brother I'm having an awful time an awful struggle it sure is but I've got a hope that someday our blessed Lord will come and the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. Hallelujah. The morning breaks eternal bright and fair. And when His chosen ones, church of God, assemblies and all, when the chosen ones shall gather to their homes beyond the sky, when the road is called up yonder, I'll be there. <laughs> and I'll be there with you, brethren, one heart, one accord, never to be apart no more. That's the day we're laboring for. Come on, come on. Uh, I didn't have this other ten minutes. Just for a testimony. Is it all right, brother? You all in too big a hurry? Okay, we'll go around. I'd like to tell you a little experience some more of something happening. Just along in the meeting, I, I don't like to make tell these things in the meeting because it might sound personal. You, brother, are or man, you, you, you understand. The meeting in India not long ago. I want to tell you the infallibility of vision. And in the, I'd had a vision recently of going over to India and into Africa. And the Lord had told me, He said, you go to Africa first then up to India, and through some mix-ups and so forth, the manager said to me, I don't want to refer as manager. I never say to Brother Vale being manager. We've got one manager, that's the Holy Spirit. Um, Brother Vale's my associate. He's my brother. He just happens to be making the arrangements for the meetings and helping me along, and he's no more a manager of my meeting than I am of yours or you, or the rest of you are the same. We're just all one great big family and one big body. We're not one above the other. And we're all just the same. We're a unit of God working together. And I wrote the vision immediately after I had, I had the vision that morning. And um, then when the manager, as we call him that for the time being, had made an arrangement to go into India, and he, he didn't kind of like Africa very much, so he said to me in Chicago, he said, Brother Bram, let's just bypass Africa and go on to India. I said, that's up to you, brother. Wherever the Lord wants me to labor, all right. I feel that, brother. And like in here, whether we have, I would rather be down here in this meeting with five people attending in that 6,000 auditorium and be in the will of God than to have the place turn away 5,000 every night and be out of the will of God. See? The main thing is do the will of God, whether it's small or whether it's great, 
whatever it is. I just held a revival in a church that held 20 people. A revival. I don't have any television. I don't have any programs to sponsor or anything. People just pay the expense, and that's all there is to it. See? See? And so I don't want any of those things. If I do, I'm obligated. You think our dear brother Oral Roberts, which is my bosom friend and a real man of God, do you think that Oral Roberts could come to a place and hold a meeting for two or three days in a church that held 20 people when it takes about seven or $8,000 a day for him to thrive? Certainly he could. He'd like to, but he can't do it. He's under such an obligation. Now, I haven't got the brains to do what he's doing. And God knows that, so he lets Oral do that. He just keeps me this way where I can... <laughs> See, if we just... If we just realize what, what, our, our limited, what we can do. So then, I don't have to have money, so that's, there you are, see? I can go anywhere he sends me. If he wants me to go to Africa and preach to 100,000 people, he'll produce the money. He's got all of it anyhow, so I don't have to ask for it. So he just gives it to me. He wants me to go down to, to the old saint of Tin Buck Two, gravel switch or somewhere, you know, and preach to 10 people. Amen. I just go and stay till he tells me it's over, so... That's the way I, I try to live that way. And I don't have nothing, no programs to support or nothing. See? Now, I'm not saying. See, now, that's my part. Now, Brother Oral Roberts, God give him something else to do. And Brother A.A. A. Allen and many of those other brethren who has great radio broadcasts and things, they've got to have money. I help support them myself. I do all that I can. Because I realize that's my brother. I couldn't fill his place now. I'm kind of glad that I don't have to. <laughs> because I haven't got the mental powers to work those things out. And so I just stay the way I am. You, as Congressman Upshaw used to say, you can't be nothing that you hate. <laughs> uh, that's right. And the quicker we realize that, the better off we'll be. Amen. You just be what you are. God wants you the way He made you. And just keep that in mind. And be just what, if it's a doormat, be a doormat. I want to be the best doormat He ever had. If, if I have to be the doormat or whatever it is in the house of God, let me serve my office the best that I can for him. Now, so in Africa, he didn't want to go. And I said, all right, we won't go. Then on the road back, I went to my room. And when I did, there was a light hanging there at the door. He said, you'd go to Africa, like I said. I called brother back uh, uh, in a few minutes and said, we're going to Africa. I waited for a year. And finally, how I'd done it, I don't know. But another wave come up. I found my road on my way back to India. When I met, met Lisbon Portuguese, where it's to have a meeting there, going on over and had a healing service right in the shadows of the Vatican City in Rome. But while I was in Portuguese, I fell sick. I didn't know why. I was out with the governor, and I was having some fish, and they cook it in olive oil, and my eyes were really sick. I was trying to be gentleman to eat it, but I did. I was white around the mouth. I was so sick. That old fish, and it cooked in olive oil. So, and he said, Brother Branham, you look a bit ill. And I said, I feel the same way. <laughs> so when I went down to my hotel room, a doctor come up after a while. Honest, I, I'm not trying to make remarks, but he had a pill there as big as a box at the top of that thing and wanted me to swallow it. I said, Doctor, I, I wouldn't give that to my saddle horse. I said, and so, well, you couldn't get it down your throat. I've never seen such a pill in my life. And I said, you, can I break it apart? He said, oh, swallow it. And I said, well, just a minute to this sickness wears off. I waited. He got out and throwed the thing away. So then, but he was a, a nice man. And, um, and we talked a lot on the Lord Jesus, him being a Catholic. So, but we talked about the Lord. And then, uh, while I was got so sick that night, Billy stood by me. And the rest of them had left me there. And I said, Billy, I don't think I can make it till morning. And I was just so sick, I just, just couldn't, I couldn't breathe no more. I was so sick, my breath wouldn't even come hard. I had to force my breath. And that way, all night, the next morning, I started into the bathtub to take a, a bathroom to get in one of those big tubs, of, a towel twice the size of these tables. And, and so I was going to take a, a bath, and there hung that light hanging there. And it said, didn't I tell you to go to Africa first? I fell on my face and began weeping. Then uh, I said, Lord, uh, I, I, just let me go somewhere and get me a little cabin out in the mountains and trap and hunt like I've always wanted to. I, I couldn't be your servant. I, I haven't even got the, the mental powers to serve you. I said, I, I forgot all about that. And I wrote it down and got it. I thought I had it in my pocketbook now, but I haven't. But I've got it on paper. Well, I went on. He told me to go on up to India, which I did. 
And then when I come back thinking for four years now that I disobeyed the Lord, and when I looking on that vision wrote out, which I've read it hundreds of times, the vision said that I would go to India first and then back to Africa. But he told me to go to Africa first and then to India, showing that God knew that I would fail him, but his word, what he says, can't fail. The vision actually reads that I would go to Africa first, uh, to India first and then back to Africa. That's where I'm on my road to now. Just as soon as I get through about 20, 30 meetings I've got between now and July, and we go to Africa. Brother, our dear brother David Duplicy there has been over and talking to the brethren and so forth to get together. In India, I'd like to quote the meeting home, just how it was taking place. When we went in there, there was no unity. Brethren all separated. One church is sponsored. And the rest of them wouldn't come in with it because they didn't like that church. See, there you are. And literally these 470 million people in India. And Christianity is the weakest religion they got. Christianity. With Catholic and all, we rate about third or fourth place. The Mohammed is twice or three times our size. That's including all of Christianity. And when I got there, because this one church, their principle was, sell India to India. We need not the missionaries. We need not the Americans. When I landed at Bombay, there stood the Methodist bishop and many of the, the great men standing there. The Mr. Branham, you coming to India, don't you come here as a missionary? Said, we know more about the Bible than you Yankees ever did know. <coughs> Now, no critical, not critical, but that's the truth. This is an oriental book. It's not a western book. It's an eastern book. When you get the eastern view of it, you found a new book. That's right. That we had the Bible 2,000 years before you as a nation. That's right. St. Thomas went down there. St. Thomas Church, I was at it when we were there. Sure, they had the Bible 2,000 years early before we was a nation. And we got a, a western thought, trying to make it compare with an Eastern, which is just contrary one to the other. All the parables and things of the Bible, if you ever come in there and just find their, the way they live, you can see the Bible just open up a new book to you. Because it's an Eastern book wrote in an Eastern way of living. And we're a Western people in a Western way of living. If the Lord willing, this week when I start preaching, I want to preach when the East and West meet. Now, no, they wouldn't do it because they didn't like this other church because it wouldn't agree upon our, our brethren. Now, to look at it, I said, well, that's right. Let's sell America to America. The, 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 the Indian people said, we want to own our own property. We don't want the Methodists and Baptists and Pentecostal people over in America to own our property. We want to own it ourselves right here. Let us have it. Said, so, you brothers come over and visit us. That sounded all right. See? But for me to be there like that, it wasn't all right. Those missionaries have sweated blood in there for years for the things that they stood for. They died with amoeba with yellow fever and black water fever and everything else in there to bring the gospel. Should I turn my back on a thing that a man has established like that for the kingdom of God? I'm his brother. Certainly not about their property. Who does it belong to anyhow? God. Amen. Exactly right. But in there... Well, which I did, and they told me that they couldn't cooperate. That night, they, that day, the mayor of the city took me down to the temple of the Jan. And Jan, 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 I forget, Jan, Jan. Jan. And they're a funny sect. They're more on the order of Catholic. They've taken me into their Pope, sitting on a pillow. And this show you the tortures they go through. The man and the women sit making little mops. They wouldn't kill an ant. They, they can't work. They have to beg everything they get. 400 million of those Indians are almost, there's about 70 million of them, I guess, that, uh, that works, and the other 400 million is beggars. And they mop the floor as they go to the ground to keep from stepping on an ant because they believe in reincarnation. It might be some of their people. They won't kill nothing. Not a fly or a flea. A man operated on his own finger and he died over because he wouldn't sterilize the knife that he operated on afraid he'd kill a germ. It might be some of his ancestors on the road back. Now you can see the world living in ignorance like that and we with the real gospel and our guns on one another. See what I mean, brethren? 
That's fussing whether I should be a church of God or assembly of God. I want to be a child of God. Amen. 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 That's it. Now, and a servant of God. Notice. Then in that, these men sitting there in that condition, they couldn't pull, they couldn't shave. It was a sin to shave. So they had to pull their beards out and pull their hair out. And to and all the things they had to do, it was terrible. There this Pope sat there as he was. And I heard this 17, I believe, or seven or eight different ones spoke represented there. And me coming in, each one of them told me how little I was. Why, those Jans, they said, well, they begin before Genesis ever started. <laughs> and they were so far superior to Christian, and they have a lot of good points. Here's what that Pope said to me. He said, you people call yourself religious? And you use all your scientists, all your scientists over there, not to try to help someone, but to create atomic bombs to blow one another to pieces. Was he right or wrong? See, every lie's got a lot of truth in it. That's right. Now, if it's a real lie, just a right, what we call the black lie, or the little white lie, the little white lie is the real lie. You can see the big black line, but it's that little white one got a whole like the one that the devil told Eve. See, just one little thing off the cater. That's what the our churches are listening to today. They're saying, "Oh, you're right in your principle of baptism. You're right in this, and you're right in that." But he fails to let you know you got to have love for that brother out there, though he's right or wrong. Stand shoulders with him. The kingdom of God and the presence of God. Now, watch this. How God works. And these fellows, as they were sitting there, and then I felt like, after they'd all spoke, or several of them spoke, I felt like I'd be a traitor to Christ if I didn't say something. And I stood up and I said, Gentlemen, I couldn't call them brother, and they wasn't. I said, How could you ever accept a blood sacrifice for your sins and won't kill a flea? I said, How could you do it? I said, Blood is the antidote. Blood was the one that brought us from the garden into blood cell is life. It was life, perverted life, that brought us to death. It'll take that same blood cell breaking to bring us back to life again. This is a perverted life. And I want you, to, brethren, no matter how well you try to patch up and how well you try to do this and how clean you try to live and how righteous you try to live, It'll never work. This life in the beginning was condemned by God and it ain't to be patched up. It's to die and to be born again. It's got to be a birth. There's no other way around it. See? Not be better. Join church. Quit your meanness. You can do all of that and still not have eternal life. See? You can join church. You can belong to a denomination. You can live just as straight as a die. Those Pharisees did. And Jesus said, you're your father, the devil. See? We're trying to put it on works all the time. Something we can do. Something we can build. Some, God don't need our building. God needs our soul. And there, in that time, that night, when I said, let God speak, the one that's God tonight. And in the platform. Now, you, I'm doing this, uh, saying this so that you, brethren, would see the confidence you can have in God. And in that meeting that night, when they started, there was the Rajals on pillars, and there was the Mohammeds and the Buddhas. And it taken me better than two and a half hours to even get to the stand where I was going to preach. The mayor estimated that if I stayed the three days or the five days, I was supposed to stay, there would be 500,000 outside people in Palm Bay. Said her, they come. I thought, well, if these preachers don't want to cooperate, let them alone then. But I made a mistake. I should have turned and come back till I got cooperation. Because that night, when we went to the meeting, the, you couldn't give out prayer cards. There was no way of doing it. So we had the militia to kind of bring up one at a time. And then they, there are thousands <clears throat> and thousands and thousands of thousands of people. Who's going to be the first in the prayer line? <laughs> the people that you can't even talk to. But then when the Holy Spirit began to reveal to them and began to tell them, I'd see who, what there was spell their name out. I couldn't even pronounce it. The place. Then I could feel coming in by the Holy Spirit 
that it was, they were thinking it was a telepathy. So I thought, Lord, if you'll just give grace. About three or four had passed. The leper passed, had no arms. And and I took him in my arms and began to love him. He just wept when he seen that somebody cared for him. The world dying for love. Now you take your brother in your arms. See if it don't make things a little different. That same love that worked on a leper will work on your brother that you think is wrong. That's right now. And he, I took him in my arms. And he, he cried. And about the second after that was a blind man. There'd been another blind man went through. Told him who he was, where he'd come from, everything. I said, the Lord God has healed you, brother. Years ago, he died for you and your healing is secured. If you just believe it now, go on, get well. Two or three of the lepers that passed through all the only thing I saw was who they were and what was, was it. I didn't say no more. That's all I can say is what I can see. Now I just quit saying. Then this one come to a blind man and told him who he was, said, you're a beggar, you got two children, you got a wife, she's a thin woman, told her what her name was and her given name. That was all right. And then when I started to pass him on through, a vision broke. Now that's when the Lord's speaking. The other is what the man was doing himself. That's what you see on the platform. It's you doing it, not me. It's your own faith to doing it. Now, then when that broke, I looked and I seen the man standing before me. He looked a little grayer than what he was there. And he could see. His eyes were, was open. And he was rejoicing and talking to people. That's the keynote. There it was. I thought, oh God. There it is. How that there's no way, brethren, we're eternity bound people and we're going to stand in his presence together one of these days. I mean face to face with him. There's no way to explain it. When you know that it's going to happen, there it is. I've never seen it one time ever face. The other day, Waterloo, after that punch a minister saw it against me. And I was praying. Oh, Lord, here I am in a predicament I don't know what to do. Hundreds of people sitting there, just as cold as it could be, standing there. And of a sudden I heard something. I thought it was an airplane coming in the roof. I looked around at Dr. Vale, and he was looking at the organ. He thought the, the woman had reversed the organ air. You come to find out it was electric organ. And here it was coming from the above, like a roar. And it come down. My coat began shaking. It swept out over the building. The people just turned white and fell backward with their heads back like that. A rushing like a wind. Only it wasn't a wind. It was a sound. The Holy Spirit moving through the building shaking. And we've got it on tape. And I thought the great Holy Spirit doesn't misbehave himself anyway. I thought, I've never seen him do nothing but what was in the Scripture. And when I went home, I began praying, Lord, where was... Where would this be if the Holy Spirit acted like that? In St. John 12, we see where our Lord was praying. And some of them said when the Father spoke back to him, that it thundered. God still lives, brethren. And we're looking for something way out yonder when we got it right now. This is it. Don't let it pass over you like it has through the ages, like it did in the days of John the Baptist. They didn't know who he was. People don't know what this Holy Ghost is. It's not something to organize an organization over, which I'm not criticizing that, brethren. It's not something to fuss about. It's something to love and to worship. It's not to separate yourselves from one another. It's to bring one another together. We're using it as a tool not to better the kingdom of God when we make ourselves different from each other. We've got to make ourselves together with this. And the real Holy Spirit will bring that to us, brethren. It's just got to. It's, a, it's Christ's own love for us. And notice, to the, to the Indian meeting, there was the man. I seen him standing there like a blue shadow. And when the vision left me, oh, what a feeling, what a feeling. I, I knew then that it had to happen. 
It's got to happen. God said so. Now I could take the floor. I could be boss then as it was. Pardon that expression, not me, but the Holy Spirit working was Amen. the boss. <coughs> if God would come today and show me a vision that George Washington is going to be raised in the presidential graveyard, I'd invite the world to come watch it done. Amen. Exactly right. It'll happen. If God said so, how can it say? Amen. I'm 48 years old. I've seen visions since I was just a little boy of two. And never one time has it failed. To me, it's God. Amen. If I can't get the world to see it, what difference? They never see it in any age. But God's just, He sends it anyhow. That he, then when it's all over, they say, well, we didn't know that. Sure enough, did this happen? I didn't know it. Oh, yes. It's always been that way. It's Amen. that way today, brethren. Yeah. You listen. This is the hour. This is the day. Amen. You're looking for something out here and the devil trying to play something off out here sometime. You're going to be in the millennium before you know it. Amen. It's at the end time now. So then when this vision come and the blind man was seen, then he was still standing there. I said, now to you gentlemen today that we was in the Jan temple, and you all were saying that uh, uh, you started before Genesis and how uh, insufficient uh, this God was and how that all of his disciples did this, that, and the other, so forth. And I said, I know your thoughts. You're thinking that I'm reading telepathy. Because this is all you've ever seen is right here. Now, that's what's in your mind. But I said, here's a blind man. And the man has just witnessed and he went blind, which the Spirit told him 20 years ago, watching the sun. He worshipped the sun. And he'd been blind. His eyes were as white as my shirt. I said, he has promised to get his sight back again. He'll serve the God that gives him his sight. He's willing to change. I said, you, Mohammed, here, you are the greatest in number. To come here and give this man back his sight. There you are. I wouldn't have said that for nothing, brethren, if God hadn't have said so first, you see, the vision. I said, now, come and give him his sight. And I said, you Buddha worshippers, I challenge the priest of the Buddha to come give him his sight. Are you Jens that was in the temple today? I challenge any of you priests to come give him his sight. And he'll worship the God that gives him his sight. Amen. Oh, brother. It was a quiet bunch. <laughs> Certainly it was. And I said, what, what could you do? You tell him he was wrong in worshiping the Son. He's worshiping. I said, I believe he's wrong. He is worshiping the cre creation instead of the Creator. See? I said, I believe he was wrong. But I said, what would you Mohammeds do if you changed him? You don't want to change his way of thinking. <coughs> what if you Jans took him? You'd change his way of thinking. What if you Buddhists tuck him? You'd change his way of thinking. That's right. Psychology. But brethren, I want to ask you something. What more would the Methodists do for him than the Baptists could do? We got the same thing in America. That's right. Only we got one God we worship. But all the Baptists wants them all to be uh, Baptists and wants all the Methodists and Pentecostal wants to make them all Pentecostal. Church of God wants them all on their side and the assemblies wants them all on their side. What is it? Oh, they got to be baptized just as this and that or they got to say certain things. They got What is it? Psychology. Yes. I'm not going to hurt feelings, but brother, I must be honest. This may be our last time we'll ever... Amen. It's true. I said, we got the same thing in America. Just from this church to that church. If the church of God don't treat me right, I'll join the assembly. If the assembly don't treat me right, I'll be in oneness. And there you are. What is it? The same thing. Like pagans. Heathens. It's true. Anchor yourself in Christ once. Amen. Stay there. That's right. Then, when I said certainly you could do no more for him. One from the other, no matter who it would be. But I said, you can't give him his sight, you Mohammeds, neither can you Jans, and neither can you Buddhas or any of you can give him his sight. And neither can I give him his sight. 
But I said, the God of heaven who raised up his son Jesus. But you're thinking it's telepathy. Has showed me a vision that the man will receive his sight. And if he doesn't, I'm a false prophet. And now if he does, how many of you will raise your hands that you'll forsake your pagan God? You see where your priest is standing? Every one of them. They're silent people. No wonder they're silent. I'd be silent too if the God of heaven hadn't showed me something just now. I said, now we'll find out whether it's right or not. And everybody was quiet. I got the poor old fellow and pulled him to my bosom. I said, Lord God, who made the heavens and earth, as it was in the Bible times, it has returned again. Let it be known today that you're God, and your church shall prevail against every gate of hell. It shall be. And many of these men sitting here who's labored out here, thinking that these things belonged in another age, let them know that their labors are not in vain. They preach the best that they know how under the circumstances and the things they had to preach by. But now thou has come on the scene. They don't interpret the prayer, of course. And in praying to the Lord, I had him lean against my bosom. When I tucked him away like that, he let out a scream with all of his might. He ran and grabbed the mare of Durban and kissed him. His sight was as good as any man that's in here. Hallelujah. Then what happened? Hallelujah. There he was standing there. He fell on his knees. He threw his hands in the air. He wept. Thousands watching him. That man has testified even to the president of India, which up at New Delhi, this coming October, if I wish, they got a, a ample theater up there that I can put a million people in for a united effort all over India. Then I said, how many of you here will receive Jesus as personal Savior, you Mohammeds and Buddhas and so forth. Their hands went up everywhere. Everywhere. Amen. And they made a rush. They took, pulled my shoes off. They tore my... I was over an hour getting out of it. Threaded clothes. Five or six lines. Could not hold them back. They'd run over their legs and everything. Indians are superstitious. They want to touch you or something like that. Of trying to get in. Mothers even throwing their babies. To try to get to the touch. I had to leave the city the next day because they couldn't hold him any longer. One old place to put him. Jesus said, go preach the gospel. Hallelujah. That's right. We've built around Hallelujah. schools, organizations, education. Yes, that's right. Nothing against it. That's all right. Nothing against it. But he said, preach the gospel. He never said, build churches. He never said build organizations. Right. He never said build schools. He never said have seminaries. He said preach the gospel. Amen. We turn around and done something else. That's the reason the heathens in the shape they are today. That's the reason these things are. But my brethren, are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob still is today. Amen. That's right. He's the same God. It reminds me of one little thing I'll say. I've got to go there. If you have just just a couple minutes, as everybody knows, I like to hunt. A brother sitting here from Northern British Columbia. One day I come out of the mountains with whiskers about that long. They're turning gray. <laughs> there was big old slouch hat pulled down, overhauls, and hadn't had a bath for over two weeks, and, and had twenty-one head of horses and. I guess I smelled worse than the horses did. I've been not taking a bath and dirty and sweating. And I've been bear hunting up in the mountains. How the experiences that I had with God there will live with me till I die. I'll be alone. I was in a little place where they had a, a store just about the size of half of this room. They had everything there. A young woman there, about 30 years old, had never seen a city in her life. In her life. So far back, I guess the first real hard top road to be Edmonton, about Edmonton, that'd be four or five hundred miles away. Yes. Yeah. 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 Been about two hundred miles away. Yeah. Two hundred miles to a hard top yeah. road. And then you leave that, then you got another one, a long stretch of it. Way up at East Pines, northern British Columbia. Standing back there trying to pull the panniers on the horses and tighten up the... A man's come down through there. 
said, hello, Brother Branham. That was him. The farmer, the Lord gave a vision, called him to the work, and now he's just returning from Cuba and on his road back again now Hallelujah. in the field. I was down in a way northern place, and a lady walked up, all that beard and stuff, the lady walked up and touched me on the back. But aren't you, Brother Brandon? I said, yes, ma'am. How'd you know me? But I got your book. I said, how'd you ever get a book back there? It comes twice a year, a mail on a dog sled. Oh, they'll come from the east and the west of that great town. Way up in the mountains one time in Colorado, I was hunting elk. I have to kill the game just to be alone with God. You can have all your feather age Florida you want to. That's what man done to it. I like it the way God made it. Oh, just in its raw nature. I climbed way high in the mountain. Way high. Because the elk hadn't come down yet. There's not enough snow to run them down. I was at least 35 or 40 miles from a human being. Way back between Berthet Pass and Rabbit Ear Pass. Way back on the Troublesome River. Or used to herd cattle when a boy. I got a little thing I want to say right here about that. I used to, when they had the roundup in the spring, when we put the cattle up on the Repertoire Forest, the Herford Association grazes the valley. And if you can raise a ton of hay and got a, a brand from the Chamber of Commerce, you can herd a cow on the Repertoire Forest in the summer. So we herded down there. And our brand was a tripod and a, a big diamond, uh, a, di a, di a barn. Bar Diamond was next to us there, which was Grimes, and all of you know Grimes the race horse man. He had, he worked about twenty men all the time. And we had we ours a small outfit. We had the last place of irrigation off the of east fork of the Troublesome River, way up. So then where the rivers divided like this and come down from the north, uh, east and west slope, well, then we grazed that in there 150, 200 miles through there. We grazed it. So they had a drift fence from the private owned property until the government property. Many times have I sat there of a day and watched him when he's taking those cattle through. I sat with my leg around on the saddle, as you all know, watching him, and the ranger stood there counting those cattle as he went through. He examined those cattle. Brother, he didn't look so much about the brand. It was the breed of the cattle. The brand could go in, it had something to do with it. But it was the blood of the cow. No matter what brand was on, if, she, if that cow wasn't a thoroughbred Herbert, she couldn't go on that far. I think that's the way it would be his judgment. It'll not be whether you're a church of God or assembly of God. It'll be the blood mark that'll tell the difference. No matter what kind of a brand you're wearing, it'll only be those who are born again or go in. Up on those mountains I watched. Come up a storm and I got behind a tree and stood there for a little bit while the storm was going on. And all of a sudden... As the storm is over, I come out behind a tree, it'll storm a while, rain, then it'll snow a while, and then the sun will come out and melt it off, and maybe it'll rain again. And when I come out, it turned cold, and I'm behind this tree, and the sun was going down into the west, and the great eye peeping across this way, and there the rainbow would come across the valley, where the, the evergreens had froze with the rain, you know how to freeze on the trees. And the sun against it made a, a rainbow. Now I looked at that rain. My mother, my mother's mother come off this reservation up here. My conversion didn't take the call the deep out of me. I love the woods. So I stood there and I started crying. Our old great Jehovah, as I said last night, he guides my steps by his eye. So then there he is looking. There I thought, yes, the sun is dying in the west. The day is over. The rainbow represents the covenant. We're at the end time. You look anywhere, you can see God if you just look around a little bit. You can see him in the brother that you don't like so well. You can just look at him. You can see him in the organization that you don't like. You can just look around. He'll be there. Don't worry. And then I watched that and I started... Weeping. In a few moments, I heard the old gray wolf call up on top of the mountain and mate answer down in the bottom. You know, David said, when the deep calls to the deep, 
uh, uh, deep begin calling to me. I heard the old bull elk bugle. The storm had separated them through the massive blowing, the timbers falling. The herd had got broke up. They were bugling one to another to come back together. The mate of the wolf was calling, let's come back together. The eye was calling to the rainbow, let's come back together. Amen. The spirit's calling to the church, let's come back together. Amen. Let's unite. Amen. God was there. And while I was standing there worshiping, oh, I run around and around that tree as hard as I could go, just to give vent to my feelings, screaming to the top of my voice, shaking my hand. Then I thought I was a holy roller, sure enough, for somebody to see me. But, or maybe I was insane, running around and around that tree, but I was worshiping God. I see everything calling, the deep calling to the deep, like the Spirit is now calling to the church, calling to the body. Let's come together. Let's be together. The sun setting is later than you think. Let's come together. Oh, do not have ears to hear and not hear. Oh, behold, I would break down all the places and unbelief in the hearts of my people. But I have ordained that Adam and this should be a place where I would show forth my power and my glory. I would have it to bud in a dry and a thirsty land. But ye have let Satan come and make it a desert. But I say that rivers shall spring forth through the ministry of my servant, which I have sent among you. Yea, a prophet, and if you will hear the words, and not only hear them, but let them be demonstrated in my life, yea, with love. If you will let that same atmosphere penetrate your lives that penetrated the upper room in the early days of Pentecost, I will let a new outpouring of my spirit be poured out upon this city, and ye shall see the glory of God, and ye shall be able to sing, O oh Lord, how great thou art. For I, the Lord thy God, will call my people. I will lead them, yea, as the shepherd leads his sheep, and ye shall come to a oneness of the Spirit and the unity of the faith as I have ordained in the last days. Oh, my people, say not within myself, how can such a great work be wrought? For he that is among you has been ordained that I have sent him to this place. And if he will come into that unity, I will show you the great power of the Lord. He shall be filled with the fullness of God. And the gifts and the fruits of the Spirit shall be operated freely in thy life. Hear thou the word of the Lord this morning. Where did the Spirit speak? On the rainbow, the sun called the rainbow. When the wolf called his mate, when the elk called its mate, Jesus is calling his mate the church. God bless you, brethren. I'm here shoulder to shoulder with you at the throne of God to help you in every way that I can. I'm your brother. Hallelujah.